It's such a treat to follow Selena's dynamic presentation. Uh, my name is Kat Morgan. I work for the Rockefeller Foundation on their global food team, but I also contribute to the PTFI's efforts. Um, and I'm thankful to Emory University for hosting the conference because just a few years ago, I was a student, an undergraduate here at Emory in this very lecture hall. So it's a very full circle moment for me. Um, before I begin the presentation, I would like to acknowledge and thank my collaborators, um, Dr. Selena Ahmed, who you just heard speak from the PTFI, Dr. John De La Parra at the Rockefeller, Rockefeller Foundation, Dr. Sarah Brinkley at the PTFI, and Teresa Warren at Montana State University. So here's a high-level overview of the steps in our scoping review process that I'll discuss in detail today. Um, and due to the ongoing nature of the review, we're still in the data charting process, but I do have some preliminary findings to share, as well as some information about research gaps. So the aim of this scoping review is really to inform PTFI efforts. So we're interested in synthesizing information on key upstream factors in the food system that drive uh, variation in the biochemical composition of foods downstream. And so our goal is to help inform PTFI efforts, the efforts of the scientific community at large, and hopefully contribute to generating evidence to producing food that is good for people and planet. So given the broad objectives of our research question, we decided to pursue a scoping review instead of a tra traditional systematic review. And scoping reviews really serve to synthesize evidence um, and assess the scope of literature on a topic. So in this review, we're specifically interested in agricultural management factors, as well as environmental and climate factors, um, and how those influence variation in food crop composition. Um, and our objectives are really to identify and map out how these upstream factors change the variation of crop composition. We're also interested in mapping out gaps in the literature. And finally, uh, identifying groups of food molecules that are really vulnerable to shifts based on these upstream drivers. For the protocol of the scoping review, we're using the preferred reporting items for systematic reviews and meta-analyses, also known as the PRISMA guidelines. Um, and these ensure that our scoping review follows best practices in reporting. Uh, it's basically a framework extension that provides a checklist for us um, to ensure transparency, rigor, and completeness in the review. And our search strategy focused on peer-reviewed articles from 2000 to present present, and we're looking at qualitative, quantitative, and mixed methods research. Um, additionally, for the screening and charting process of this review, we're using Covidence, which is an online platform that facilitates collaborative article screening, reviewing, um, and data extraction for scoping reviews. And this is really great because it simplifies the management and collaboration process of our review from abstract screening to full text screening, and finally data charting. For the search, uh, we initially conducted a preliminary search of the literature using our research question across seven databases. And we did this to identify key concepts and themes to identify the development of our search terms. And so we evaluated the relevance and comprehensiveness of these retrieved studies, um, addressing the upstream drivers, types of crops that we wanna look at, um, and indicators of biochemical composition in foods. We then developed a table of 150 search terms, um, and we used three databases to conduct our actual search of the literature because we found in our preliminary search there was a lot of overlap in indexed literature. Um, so we chose these specialized databases to align with our topic, but also to um, balance breadth of results with uh, specificity in our pulled articles. Um, so we selected 67 search terms to address the upstream drivers of variation in food composition. And these uh, key search terms cover themes like agroecological management practices, um, conventional agriculture versus regenerative agriculture, climate change factors like rising CO2 levels and rising temperatures. Um, so we're really trying to capture how these upstream drivers might change food crop composition. We also identified 46 search terms to try to capture some of the actual biochemical changes within foods based on the literature. And so these are looking at anti-nutrients, antioxidants, micronutrients, macronutrients, um, as well as heavy metals that potentially bioaccumulate in our foods um, and pesticide runoff and more. 
And of course, this is not an exhaustive list, but these are just examples for the sake of our search terms. Um, so as far as the abstract screening process goes, we pulled just over 17,000 articles and imported those into Covidence, and a team of nine screeners reviewed about 3,000 abstracts, and then just under 2,000 were deemed relevant for the review. And so the review process followed a very rigorous predetermined protocol for inclusion, inclusion and exclusion criteria. And only one reviewer was required to screen each abstract because this review is very broad. In a perfect world, we'd have time to screen 17,000 articles, but this is not a perfect world. Um, and importantly, our justification for this is that Covidence randomly assigns articles. So this justifies us selecting a specific subset um, to ensure representativeness of the different types of studies pulled, um, and also just makes the review much more manageable regarding resources and time. And finally, uh, continuing some discussion about our abstract methodology, uh, detailed instructions for article inclusion were given to the entire screening team to ensure consistency, and every screener underwent an onboarding and a training process. Um, and so they participated in a test screening process as well. And before any screening began, we had three core team members conduct an initial pilot test. Um, and this was to identify potential complications or ambiguities during the screening process. Um, before finalizing our, our onboarding materials. And the pilot test included three clear positive cases and three clear negative cases. And then finally, to enhance our screening, our abstract screening methodology, we include a maybe screening decision um, that would allow a screener to flag an article for review by a second team member. So overall, this process was pretty robust, um, and we designed it to ensure thoroughness, um, consistency, and minimization of bias, given the, the broad um, scoping nature of our research question and our review. For a full text screening, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the review is, is still underway, um, but we developed a standardized data extraction Excel spreadsheet, um, which includes predefined categories and variables um, just to guide the extraction process. Relevant study variables were extracted from each study to try to capture some of these information about upstream factors, downstream factors. As I mentioned earlier, we're really interested in specific biomolecules and mapping those out. Um, and so the variables that we're mapping include, you know, study characteristics, author, year published, um, sample characteristics. We're interested in the type of crop being grown, the geography of the study to make sure that, you know, we have a diverse understanding of different areas of the world, different types of crops being grown. Um, but we're also interested in the upstream factors, these agricultural management factors, climate drivers, and then finally, um, outcomes related to crop composition. And so the extracted data will definitely be expanded on. Um, we're going to continue our analysis uh, as we finish up the review, and we're hoping to synthesize and identify patterns, um, identify gaps in the literature. And as you can see at the bottom of the slide, there's a snapshot of our data extraction form. And it's it's a small snapshot because of the constraints of how small the slide is. I couldn't include our, our entire columns, um, but that's for your reference. So uh, for our preliminary charting results, um, our initial analysis revealed a pretty wide range of upstream factors influencing crop, crop composition. Uh, so soil quality, water availability, climate conditions, and definitely management practices, conventional agriculture versus more regenerative or agroecological practices um, definitely seem to uh, cause variation in crop composition. So there's a lot of complexity and we're gonna have to further tease out these relationships as the review moves forward. But as some preliminary findings, uh, we found that potentially toxic elements like cadmium or lead, for example, have limited translocation to edible parts of the plants, but they may cause altered radical scavenging activity within the crops themselves. Um, we also noted that elevated CO2 level appears to generally decrease protein content in many crops, but there may be some offsetting of this by rising temperatures. We're still teasing out the literature before making any firm conclusions. As far as agricultural practices and interventions go, um, it appears that soil bacteria can influence nutrient levels of foods. Um, and also management practices that rely on natural amendments may increase vitamin C levels in certain fruits. 
And as far as some preliminary research gaps that we've identified, there's definitely a need for more research on some of the biological, physiological, and biochemical processes that mediate the effects of these drivers on crop composition. Um, so this would help provide insights for more targeted management strategies. And we also noticed that there aren't a lot of studies assessing some of the long-term effects. So uh, how might over time climate change, for example, or conventional chemical laden agriculture um, over time affect food crop composition. A lot of these studies are snapshots from a very specific point in time. So it'll be important to consider some of these longitudinal effects uh, as we move forward with targeted management practices. Uh, and finally, we noticed a research gap that there's not a lot of literature looking at interactions between drivers. So a study might look at rising CO2 levels um, affecting rice composition, but, it do, but they don't account for management practices, for example, or rising temperatures, for example. So it'll be really important to see down the line how these drivers interact with one another um, to potentially you know, exacerbate some um, mal changes in biochemical composition, um, or they might offset each other, like we may be seeing with rising CO2 levels and rising temperature. So our findings will be applied by the PTFI to capture really important metadata when analyzing food composition, as my colleague, Dr. Sarah Brinkley, will uh, discuss later in her presentation. And we hope that our uh, review contributes to the field of foodomics um, and informs research on in interventions for sustainable and nourishing food systems. So in the final manuscript, we will categorize and map out these specific drivers. And we hope that we'll be able to uh, expand um, our understanding of gaps in the literature, and finally map out the groups of food biomolecules that are most sensitive to shifts based on these upstream drivers. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you so much, Kat, for that very insightful look into where we are with our scoping review right now. Um, I did want to let everyone know if you have questions for myself, Kat, or Selena, we will do a panel style um, at the conclusion of my talk. So just hold your questions until that point. Um, so I'm Sarah Brinkley. Um, I am the uh, postdoctoral fellow with the PTFI, and I'm situated with a uh, co-secretariat at the Alliance of Bioversity, SEAT, um, in charge of food sampling and um, all of the myriad um, tasks that that involves. So I'll be talking to you today about uh, the metadata from the point of production to the plate. Um, and give you an appreciation for, again, our large network of um, this decentralized, democratized database that we're building, our centers of excellence and national partners, as well as our core lab at Colorado State. Um, and so we are creating this open source, publicly accessible for non-commercializable purposes, um, database to look at the world's edible biodiversity. And we want to answer these questions um, about how food composition is linked to both human and planetary health. And the key for us to do that is through collection of ro robust and also standardized metadata. So not only are we standardizing our analytical platform and our data analysis platform, but we'll also be standardizing the methods for um, food sampling as well as metadata collection. Um, so I'm going to speak to you today a bit about our uh, regenerative ag metadata module, our core metadata module, um, and uh, touch a little bit on um, food data sovereignty. Um, so we are really at the stage where we have completed the collection or the identification of our core metadata, uh, which are our mandatory metadata um, on any food that is entering into our database, and we are still under development for some of our other metadata modules. Um, and I did want to sort of frame this in um, the larger conference. And so yesterday we heard from Drs. Uh, Van uh, Wick and also um, Dr. 
um, Nadia Czech about her beautiful work in Echinacea. And so um, hinting on that theme of how we are not great at understanding um, synergy or um, complex interactions, um, our metadata collection is really going to be the key that links um, together all of the complexity um, towards this uh, more harmonized, um, everything is connected food um, composition. All right, so here's a look at um, really how we are approaching our metadata collection. Um, so what you see at the bottom part of the screen is our new food um, collection form, and that enables us to collect food from the point of production, um, which could be in the field um, or also perhaps um, in the kitchen. Um, so we are following fair data management practices. Um, we're also um, streamlining our core metadata um, to answer these large questions of how climate change or other upstream drivers impact food quality. Um, we could cast a very wide net and collect every possible um, potential data point, but that really becomes a burden on the collector of those data. And so we're really taking the approach to streamline, um, also harmonizing with the USDA and their um, minimum checklist. Um, to really be able to communicate across labs, but also to the wider food quality community. Um, and so to do that, we came up with both in-house and also internationally recognized data standards, and I'll describe those in a bit. Um, and like I said, yes, we're gathering uh, data from the point of collection, and that allows us to batch upload into a cent centralized um, sample management system that also feeds into our data pipeline and to our analytical platform as well. Um, so about some of our uh, more standardized metadata um, terms that we're using, in addition to our in-house um, terms, I guess I could go back a bit actually, um, to talk about our in-house terms. So we're using terms like the specimen food name product. Um, we're also collecting information about breed or variety, um, collection date, perhaps GPS location, system of production, was it produced in an organic manner or a more conventional manner um, using aquaponics, for example. Um, and so these lay the foundation for our in-house metadata and pairing with robust, more standardizable data um, like the food on ontology. Um, and so to talk a little bit about what an ontology is, um, it's basically a standardized and machine readable um, system of classification for terms. So in this case, that has to do um, with um, all kinds of food terms, which might be applied to food safety, security, um, or agriculture, and it also describes uh, food processing traits, um, culinary or nutritional or also chemical features. Um, so we're able to use food on metadata terms and link to a specific IRI or um, internationalized resource identifier, which comes with a URL. So when we're talking about a yellow pepper, you know exactly which yellow pepper that we're um, talking about. And so we also use um, other ontologies, maybe that you're more familiar with, perhaps like the NCBI taxon for um, uh, scientific classification. Um, but there is a limitation with just using um, NCBI taxon. Um, or taxa because it doesn't necessarily contain variety information or food processing information. So using this um, globally recognized ontology food on uh, really provides a key to get at those questions of perhaps how um, growing condition or um, food processing method or variety might be impacting food quality, food composition. Um, so I know this is a very busy slide, but just to give you an appreciation for the number of um, standardized ontologies that are out there, uh, Foodon is part of this ecosystem of ontologies, which include um, the Invo, um, Agro, and CBI taxon, which I mentioned, also Kebi, which is for chemical uh, classification, which we're also using in our database. Um, just to give you a real appreciation of connecting all the way from the system of production, environmental factors, um, all the way to the plate and culinary aspects. It's truly a, a farm to fork ontology, which I like. Um, so I'm going to dive a little bit more into the agro ontology, which is something that we're looking to incorporate into our database. It's very much a work in progress, and I'd be 
Um, definitely interested in taking um, an appreciation from any of your systems thinking models um, to really build out our regenerative agriculture metadata module. Um, so, like I mentioned, we have um, our core metadata, which are really those just very basic minimum levels of key metadata to help us answer um, these drivers of food composition type questions. Um, in addition to that, we will be developing additional metadata modules, and the first one that we're working on is the regenerative ag metadata module. And so we're building from um, the agro um, ontology, which is the agronomy um, or agronomic practices based ontology developed by um, the Alliance and CGIAR, their platform, um, their big data and agricultural platform. And so um, the agro-ontology describes ag agronomic practices, um, techniques, variables. Um, so we were able to extract some of the agro-ontological -onto terms such as um, crop rotation, um, crop cover with residue, um, living co cover, um, all of the ones that you see before you. And we're able to overlay uh, regenerative, um, commonly accepted regenerative agricultural uh, principles, such as maintaining soil cover, um, integrating animals, continual living roots, uh, minimizing soil disturbance, planting diversity, and one that's not actually from the regenerative ag um, systems thinking would be nutrient cycling, which is really borrowed from uh, the agroecology world. Um, so we're really taking this bottom-up approach to our regenerative ag principles, where um, we're taking farm typology, looking at all the given farm practices that you might encounter, and really packaging into over um, overarching regenerative ag principles. Um, so that's where we are in the stage of developing that metadata module for now, with really the overall goal to get at those drivers of variation in food composition, food quality. Um, so I did say it all begins with uh, metadata collection, but not just metadata collection, um, but also responsible metadata collection or responsible data collection. Um, and so I know there is a workshop, I believe, Wednesday on um, sort of which data um, are for the taking. And we are taking a very stringent approach to um, that very question. Um, so we have um, an access and benefit sharing posture going in line uh, with the International um, Convention on Bio Biological Diversity, looking at um, the Nagoya Protocol and uh, country level specific um, uh, policy deriving from how um, natural resources or other um, plant knowledge um, products are being used. Um, and so um, John will give a talk in the second half of the session a little bit more about um, our access and benefit sharing posture and how that really um, fits in the global discussion. Um, but for now, I can say safely that um, we're definitely establishing the country of um, collection as well as the country of origin for where all of our foods are coming from. And we will not um, allow foods to pass into the database that have um, unknown uh, collection regions um, or unknown centers of origin. Um, and we're also going to be assessing these permissions um, and setting the compliance at a country level, um, but also recognize that uh, the country level does not necessarily encompass um, all of the biocultural aspects um, of access and benefit sharing. And so that's where our uh, kind of secondary approach um, comes in of not just using uh, FAIR data principles, but also using CARE data principles. Um, and we are taking the lead from Enrich and their traditional knowledge labels, biocultural labels, recognizing that digital sequence information, um, all of these metadata, um, and also biocultural information are all uh, part of the digital sequence information discussion. So I'll leave you today with some beautiful uh, food photos from our chef activist author, Alejandra Schrader, which you'll hear from in the next session. Um, and to let you know that these foods are um, currently being analyzed in our uh, food composition database. And for me, it's a real challenge to tease apart um, not just these simple, uh, minimally processed foods with one food on identifier ID, but thinking more about these complex foods and how the interaction of complex foods come together um, to support nutrition, both for the, or sorry, health for the planet and also people. So thank you all. Um, we will take some questions uh, for myself, um, Selena and Kat, if you all have any.
Yes. Thank you. Thanks. This is a, a wonderful, amazing research program you've got here. And I could ask three or four questions, but I won't <laughs> uh, do that right now. The, the first one that came to my mind is for the consumer to really care about the content of endogenous compounds in their tomato, they have to have some idea of uh, what quantity of those compounds uh, is necessary for good health or would be necessary for health benefit. And uh, we know from human experience that that ver varies greatly among individuals, but that's very controversial. And what the baseline level is, is very controversial. Uh, do you have uh, an official position on how you're going to view that question when it comes to it? Yeah, we are um, planning on working on another data interface called Stories of Food um, that will begin to tackle that in a more uh, qualitative way with some evidence. Um, and so thinking about collaborating with folks like uh, USDA's Food Data Central, um, very similar question came up that consumers of Food Data Central right now have these types of questions um, and how do you provide evidence that a database doesn't tell the whole story. Um, so thinking about this other database that we're calling story or data interface that will sit on top of our existing um, database and data interface to really kind of build that out. Um, so drawing from various sources and then beginning to also, um, you know, we're providing right now, we're focused on understanding what's in food. Um, and then the next step is really the linkages, you know, with human health and with planetary health and getting that evidence. Um, so our position is that, yes, we definitely want consumer accessible information um, and really using story to convey that. Anything else, John? Yeah, this is, it's a great question. And, and it's just one of many, many questions that could come up with how the data might be used. <clears throat> the primary mission of the PTFI is to create a database as a first step that is more comprehensive than we've seen before for food composition. So that's, you know, identities and quantities for specific chemicals, the compounds that are in food. How that, you know, and, and Selena mentioned the 16, 1700 foods that we'll be looking at. It's important to think about how the, that's not the be all end all, right? This is an enabling platform, as Selena said, and it starts with identifying and quantifying compounds in a set of foods. But then all of you, people around the world, all the centers of excellence are going to ask a million different questions that hopefully could be answered through this interface that not only has identities and quantities of compounds in food, but then all the metadata that Selena mentioned as well. Um, at the foundation, we also have a project called Food is Medicine. Um, and through that project, we're also asking those questions. So we're supporting, you know, we're, we're funding projects as well that are, you know, helping us understand over time how much and what compounds actually are helpful. Um, that's a really big question and the PTFI can't answer that alone. We need researchers who now have access to more data than, you know, we hope than they've had before can now ask those questions in many different ways. Um. I am curious if there have been any trends with increased nutritional content with hydroponic crops. And another separate question is, I noticed you guys keep saying biomolecules rather than just chemicals or phytochemicals or metabolites. Is that just because of the connotation of the term chemical? Yeah. Okay. Maybe I'll take the first one because I've worked in uh, controlled environment agriculture in the past. Um, we haven't done those studies yet, right? So that's exactly that. That's a perfect, beautiful question that the PTFI hopefully could help answer. What we are funding right now are 
regenerative versus conventional or, you know, first off, what does regenerative mean? You know, this range of regenerative agroecological practices, how does that impact the, the nutrient density or the chemical composition broadly of foods versus conventionally grown foods? But that's a great research question and something that I think would be really important to look at. Um, yeah, go ahead. So we don't have conclusive findings for the scoping review, but we're asking questions like that as we're doing data charting, because that's, you know, very relevant to the scoping review, right? Upstream drivers of variation in food composition. Um, so keep your eyes open and in coming months for hopefully a published scoping review, and we may answer your question then, but I can't give you anything distinct right now. Yeah, and great question of like, why are we choosing to use uh, food biomolecules? We just find that it's all encompassing um, and it's sort of clear when we say chemicals, um, there might be some um, components that are might not be classified as chemicals. Um, and if we say metabolites, well, we have some macro micronutrients that not everybody recognizes as a you know, secondary metabolite or specialized metabolite or phytochemical. Um, so we just like biomolecules really just encompasses everything. And so um, that's why we're utilizing um, that term. But I think like, yeah, terminology is really important um, and having like global consensus of, of how we're referring um, to these things that are in food is really important. So great question. I have a follow-up question. Are there any hydroponic researchers in the room? <laughs> okay. So being uh, on... Yeah, being on the food sampling work stream, I would be glad to um, shepherd some hydroponic studies into our database. Hi, uh, can you say a little bit more about how uh, you think uh, the objective data that you extract, uh, you know, in, in you know, in the form of molecules um, and chemical composition, can possibly converge with um, uh, vocabulary of taste, maybe you know, it's subjective um subjective e e qualitative evaluation mm -hmm. of of uh, i mean for instance in the wine world you know you have a very rich complex vocabulary that is totally subjective I mean, how do you link that with, with what you're finding so i'll start um so my dissertation research uh, which i'll be talking about um in the afternoon session is looking at the um, soil management and climate change factors um, on coffee quality, both sensory and chemical. Uh, especially if you ask a sensory scientist, they would not say that their work is subjective um, or that it's necessarily qualitative. Um, it can be very quantitative, um, especially if you're using similar to ontologies, there are lexicons, flavor lexicons, which are agreed upon flavor terminologies. Um, there's a lexicon for coffee, there's a lexicon for beef, quite a few out there. Um, and if you're using um, sensory scientists that are very well trained and calibrated, um, then you can link those quantitative measures with quantitative chemical measures. Um, and I would say that that would be a really excellent demo project to be able to combine some of the sensory um, as well as our robust um, analytical platforms. Yeah, I don't have anything else to add. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge how important the sensory aspects are. Um, deliciousness drives so many food decisions or the lack of deliciousness. So um, really, really important. Right now, we are working on um, developing a quantitative aromatics platform to really understand those biomolecules um, driving flavor, um, but really those aromatics. Um, and then multiple of our centers of excellence um, in Africa and in um, uh, Wageningen University are very interested in understanding those linkages between those biomolecules and then doing sensory analysis. And so we're supporting a series of demonstration projects that's really big, beginning to build that lexicon, but um, taking small steps to get there. Anything else? Oh, yeah, the paper with Alex on deliciousness. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that is true. We are also doing a, a landscaping review looking at how um, flavor is a driver in, of increased. We're doing lots of things. Yeah, I forgot about that one. Um, but how flavor is a driver um, of increased um, agricultural or um, just in general, more biodiversity. So pending results. <laughs> Thank you for sharing this really fascinating work. Um, it's uh, absolutely mind-blowing. Um, so one, 
one of the themes that I think this work um, reinforces is um, the within differences. Uh, you know, I think that what what your work is showing is the profundity of between differences. But um, you know, just think about that slide of your your carrots or your strawberries, and 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 the theme that came out from the echinacea presentation. Um, are these databases cap capable of um, including the environments within which foods are grown and and what determ so what are the determinants of the within differences um, which I think you know within the climate change uh, context are going to become so important that's a great question and that I think that's actually the primary purpose of, of the database is to untangle those, those very uh, close questions. So we, you know, the, we've, we have these 1600 foods that we've selected, but actually what we're really interested are those in between questions. So the how, when, where, why, what of how the plant was grown. So we imagine a future where we'll have a tomato ohm, right? So you're not just looking at tomato as a, a Socratic ideal of a tomato, but you're thinking of tomato as hundreds or thousands of versions of tomato that are all the variety. So genetic variation, phenotypic variation, chemotypic variation, all the things that happen that environment and, you know, changes, flavors, storage, preparation, recipes. I mean, there's so many things that will change the chemical composition of any particular food. Right now we think of it or I think most of the world thinks of it very one dimensionally as in, you know, Apple has the, you know, this amount of X, Y, and Z compounds, but actually, you know, there's many types of apples that are prepared many ways their the environment changes them. And th those are the, exactly the questions that this database is being built to answer. Hi. I'm curious as to how this work has changed the way you guys think about food, the way you relate to food, even if it's just a question of what you eat more of or less of. I just, we don't we don't have all the data yet, <laughs> so so I think it's a little premature. But yeah, yeah, that's good, John. We don't have all the data, so I would say it. Um, the database has not so far the efforts haven't changed like my relationship to food but I think they really like celebrate it um so it's really um I think I've always been thinking about food this way but it's like all coming together and it's um all of us coming together so it's like a global celebration so I think that's what's um instead of like individually celebrating it it's like this global celebration so I think that's what's been like the big um aha in the journey Absolutely. Sorry. Uh, the other thing is, yeah, the global celebration. And, you know, I don't know how much you mentioned of when we put together the 1600 food, the inspiring foods, we reached out to organizations, small groups, large groups all over the world for them to nominate foods for that inspiring list. And you, oh, that's just scratching the surface, right? There's so many more and we want to hear from all of you and all, many, many other groups. But just the diversity and also how people prioritize the foods in their lives from Australia, we got what thirty varieties of wattle seed, which <laughs> you know that they that's what they wanted to prioritize um, to analyze. So you know, it, it's it's about a whole different cultural perspective for each different kind of grouping of prioritized foods is also really interesting. I was just going to add kind of in jest, but um, Selena likes to give us pop quizzes during our internal meetings about um, like where has our food come from. So now we have to keep like a running count of uh, all of the origins of our food or <laughs> where they've been sourced from. So I think it is just like really reinforcing a lot of the uh, personal decisions that I've made about food. And yeah, just to have this like um, camaraderie to recommit to those choices. I, I second that. I worked on farms for a, a good point in my life. Um, and so that gave me the appreciation for the management practices that it takes to actually produce the food. But then I my original undergraduate training is in cultural anthropology. So working at the PTFI has really expanded my appreciation and understanding of these biochemical components. 
Um, so Selena mentioned earlier, we see the tomato is, as the sun and the clouds and all these environments that make it like I am a tomato, you know, by those, you know, so I feel like it adds this ontological and sort of spiritual lens to, to how I do my work. Hello. So um, this is probably an interesting question, but I was thinking, like, how do you define food? And then also, what do you decide to put in the database? Because I know a lot of cultures eat a lot of different things. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And so it is a participatory um, effort. And so we really want our partners around the world um, to contribute foods. Um, and th that those might be medicinal plants, uh, but things that they consider as foods um, for analysis. And so that list that I shared, the 1,650 or something foods, um, those are nominated by experts around the world. And um, it's really now bringing the tools to the global community and um, having folks either sending samples to the labs that run PTFI methods or um, having a lab where you do that yourself. And so it's really, um, the boundary is really in um, folks that are contributing to the database. I think one final question. Oh, now I'm a little stressed out. Um, <laughs> It, what what you guys are talking about here is is absolutely tremendous, and the data that you're going to generate, I, mean, I think, huge. My question is, how do you translate that to the general public? I mean, I think scientists are going to you know do great things, and policymakers are going to be very, very well informed. But like, lack of data is not the problem with our communication. So you're making even much more complexity. So you know, what is the initiative doing to get that out to the general consumer? Yeah, and so this is something we struggle with a lot and think about all the time. Um, our first step is thinking about education. Um, and part of that education is beginning to understand how do you take this data and how do you give it meaning? How do you interpret it? Um, how do you visualize it? Um, and so we're launching this platform called Good Food You, um, open access educational platform. And it's really to take that data um, and translate it um, for it to have meaning. Um, and then beginning, continuing to work with our centers of excellence, some of them are public health institutes, um, to begin to see how do we then translate this to policy. So for example, one of our centers of excellence is the Ethiopia Public Health Institute. Um, they work on their dietary recommendations for their country. They also work on a lot of other programs for diets and nutrition, but also are now taking a more one, one health approach where they're thinking about linkages with agricultural pr um, practices. So really working with our centers of excellence and their partners to begin to think about that translation um, into solutions. And so, again, this is really like a global village um, and relying on those partners. But I think um, also our Good Food You um, is going to be really powerful in just bringing that um, more broadly. It's going to be open access. And so that's really um, an exciting way. Um, we had a convening a few weeks ago where we were thinking about communication. And I think stories keeps on coming up as a really important way of communication and then like um, emotion and like building emotion into those. And so um, we are at the data level right now, but thinking about stories in the future. And I'll just add, um, Good Food You is really exciting and important. And as part, so a little bit of history with the foundation, you know, decades ago, there was a, there were many programs that educated, that were seeking to educate folks around the world in ostensibly green revolution technologies. And we know that all the ill effects of green revolution technologies, I mean, also saving lives in terms of, uh, providing calories, but, you know, there's a lot of negative, uh, uh, unintended consequences, perhaps they came from that. Um, we in developing Good Food You, and Selena is the first Dean of Good Food You, um, intentionally wanted to do the opposite of the, that type of work where it was very much helicoptered in technologies that, you know, of a kind of, uh, Western type into uh, other parts of the world. This is m very participatory, and we have a project within Good Food You'd call Good Food Fellows. The Good Food Fellows are funded for their education and specifically for projects that are community led and participatory um, to address questions of why would food composition be important for their society, culture, their particular lens in the world. Um, so we're, it's actually we, it, one of the biggest investments for P, for the foundation has been in the, that translational education component. And then also Selena led a, a, a publication on what is in a tomato, 
what was the journal that I was in? Frontiers for Youth, um, where we wrote an article that was just for was elementary, middle school children about what is in a tomato. So we do have a vision for, you know, every this translating across all age groups eventually.